Hello, Skittles here, and well, it's that time of year again. That time where we all celebrate Jesus' birthday, but for some reason, we're the ones who are getting all the presents. Kinda weird, isn't it? And it's also that time of year where every YouTuber in the world mandatorily lists off their favourite games of the year, and then get yelled at by everyone in the comments for how wrong they are. So, once again, this is my top 10 games of 2014. And obviously this list is based on nothing but my own personal opinions, and not games that were showered by 5 star reviews by self-important game journalists who secretly wish they were all dead. But enough rambling from me, here are my top 10 favourite games of 2014. Play it off, curtain guy! Coming in at number 10. Bayonetta 2. To be honest, this one was kind of a cop-out choice because A, I've never played the first Bayonetta, 2, a time of writing, I've only managed to play the demo, and C, I couldn't think of another game to put on this list. I was planning to put the new Pokemon games here, but it's essentially the same game that was made 9 years ago, so I don't count it. From what I could gather from the free demo, Bayonetta is a witch who straps guns to her arms and legs and beats up demons from hell. So basically it's Devil May Cry, but with boobs. There's only so much I can talk about from a brief snippet of gameplay, but I will say that it looks good and the combat is as entertaining as you'd expect it to be. Flashy, fun, and half-naked women flying everywhere. Can't wait till I play the full game on Christmas! Coming in at number 9. Tomodachi Life. Tomodachi Life is a game where you can plop your Miis onto an island and you can interact with them and watch their lives go by. So basically it's Nintendo's version of The Sims. But unlike The Sims, you can't directly control their actions. You can feed them, talk to them, make them wear funny clothes and make them become friends with other Miis, but for the most of the time you don't really need to constantly watch over them. It's kind of like you're a half-assed babysitter, checking on the kids every so often just to make sure they haven't set the cat on fire. It's one of those games that everyone has a different experience with and other players get to chat about the game and share some of their funniest parts of their playthroughs. Mine was when my parents got married and had had another baby, making him my fictional brother. However, the game failed to realise that he was part of my family tree, and he soon started to fall in love with my sister. Never thought Nintendo was one for promoting incest, even if it's unintentional. Tomodachi Life is a game that's just fun to dick around with, although it does get a bit stale after a few weeks of playing. But where else are you going to find a game where you can dress up Abraham Lincoln in a hamster outfit and feed him moldy bread? Coming in at number 8. Turbo Dismount. Turbo Dismount is the spiritual successor to Stair Dismount, a game for the iOS where you push a ragdoll off various buildings and obstacles. And Turbo Dismount is more or less the same thing. But with cars! In Turbo Dismount, you can choose from a large variety of vehicles, from tractors to sports cars to a tiny chicken car. Pick the hilarious pose of your choice, press the go button, and watch the destruction unfold like a suicide bomber in a china shop. And believe it or not, that's essentially the entire game! Which may seem rather boring and repetitive, but with the inclusion of user-made levels and constant updates from developers, it makes Turbo Dismount an absolute blast of a game one can play for hours on end. Coming in at number 7... Hyrule Warriors. Hyrule Warriors is a massive departure from the rest of the Zelda series. Whereas most Zelda games focus on exploration, adventure, and mind-bending puzzles, Hyrule Warriors takes all that and goes, Bugger that nonsense, let's just go swing our pointy things at living things and make them not living things. So the main focus of Hyrule Warriors is combat, and the combat is very fun. You got your standard malarkey of light attacks, heavy attacks, and super duper instant kill special attacks if you need to pop to the kitchen and check on the roast. If you're a fan of, say, the Dynasty Warriors franchise, then it should all seem very familiar to you. Why, what's that? Hyrule Warriors is actually a crossover between Zelda and Dynasty Warriors? Why the fuck didn't you tell me this before, you c- So yes, Hyrule Warriors is actually a crossover between The Legend of Zelda and Dynasty Warriors, something I had no knowledge of when I first heard about it. But despite not being familiar with Dynasty Warriors myself, it certainly didn't stop me from enjoying the game at all. It has everything I look for in a good action game, fun combat, thousands of squishy enemies, and a kick-ass soundtrack to top it all off. If you're like me, secretly longing for death and like action games, then Hyrule Warriors is one of the best ones on the Wii U. If nothing else, it's a great stress reliever. Coming in at number 6. Mario Kart 8. Do I even need to tell you why I like this game? It sold 1.5 million copies in the first week and very quickly became one of the best selling Wii U games to date. But for those people who focus more on stuffing money into their magical boxes to make their boringly realistic game look slightly more boringly realistic and don't know what the definition of fun is, or if you live under a rock, I might as well talk about it. Mario Kart 8 is by far the best of the series so far. It looks, plays and sounds beautifully, everything has been tweaked to perfection, recovery is much faster, the driving is as tight as a corset and all the new features are really fun to mess around with. If you've played any other Mario Kart game before, then this is essentially the same, but with more stuff crammed into it. It's a racing game at its very best. Also Nintendo, if you'd be so kind as to not take down this video because I used your gameplay footage, please? Please don't beat me again! Coming in at number 5... South Park The Stick of Truth. Watch this! 
a TV licensed game on this list? <laughs> what sort of blasphemous act is this? Calm the fuck down, Gramps. I am well aware that TV and movie licensed games have a reputation for being awful, so imagine everyone's shocked faces when this game turned out to be quite good. South Park The Stick of Truth is an open world RPG set in the fictional town of South Park, which is probably enough to set people's undies on fire with excitement. You play as the new kid in town who swiftly gets roped into a fictional battle between humans and elves featuring the cast and characters from the show. And where the gameplay truly shines is in the combat which is turn-based, oddly enough. To successfully pull off any attack, you have to do a very specific quick time event style button prompt, which I think is a very engaging system because it requires more effort than simply pressing a button and watching an overly flashing animation while you go do far more interesting things before it's your turn again. Where this game stands out from most other South Park games, or just other TV and movie licensed games in general, is that the creators of the show, Matt Stone and Trey Parker, had their hand in making the game, which is a rare thing to see when content creators from another medium come over to the video game world and give it enough care and respect to make it a decent game. Overall, South Park the Stick of Truth is an engaging RPG with an endless amount of comedy thrown in to keep me more than entertained throughout my playthrough. Even if you're not a hardcore fan of the show, this game is definitely worth buying. Coming in at number 4. Shovel Knight. Shovel Knight is an indie game that has 8-bit style graphics to make it look like an NES game, which isn't exactly a unique concept since that pretty much describes every indie game ever. But how Shovel Knight stands out from the indie retro crowd is that not only does it convincingly look, play and sound like an NES game, but it's also a genuinely well designed and fun game. Shovel Knight takes the best aspects from some of the greatest NES classics like Mario 3, Castlevania, a big dollop of Mega Man and a sprinkling of Zelda 2 and DuckTales for an extra bit of added flavour. I need to stop treating video games like food. Not only does it make me hungry, but it's also terrible for my immune system. From Mario 3, it takes the overworld map screen. From Castlevania, it has the combat and different magic weapons, the level design and themed bosses from Mega Man, and the explorable towns and Pogo attack from Zelda 2 and DuckTales, respectively. You might think with all the homages Shovel Knight pays to classic NES titles, it could be considered nostalgia bait. But that isn't the case for me, because I never owned an NES. So if I like it, then it's not because I want to relive the glory days of my youth, but because the game is entertaining and enjoyable. If you're looking for a good retro game with solid gameplay mechanics, then look no further because Shovel Knight is the best one, bar none. Coming in at number 3... Octodad Dadliest Catch. It's hard to pin down the genre of Octodad. It's some sort of cross between a life simulator and a physics puzzler with pulsating big question marks next to each of them. Octodad is a game where you control the life of an octopus who is not only in disguise as a regular human, but is also a caring husband and a loving father of two children. Don't ask, it'll just make things more complicated. The gameplay mainly consists of doing really mundane stuff like making coffee, mowing the lawn, going shopping and running from your life from an insane Japanese chef. Which may sound boring, but what truly makes the game fun is in the control scheme. Since you take control of... Well, a fucking octopus, your limbs are very floppy and uncoordinated, and you can only move one of your wiggly limbs at a time. Use the analog sticks to flail your arms and the L2 and R2 buttons to move your legs. So as you can tell, the game is rather hard. Not so much the Dark Souls level of hard, where the game treats you like an Asian mother would treat its child if it got anything less than a B plus on its maths test, but more like Quop, where it replaces your hands and feet with bowling balls and stands on the far side of the room shouting half-assed encouragement at you. But despite the difficulty and frustration with the controls, Octodad is a game that's creative, silly, charming, and unbelievably fun. It's a game that'll remain an indie gaming classic for years to come. Coming in at number 2. Super Smash Brothers. Oh, don't look at me like that. With the amount of times I've spent harping on about this game, it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. It doesn't help that it was the most hyped game of the year. Well, apart from Watch Dogs. But the difference between Watch Dogs and Smash Bros is that Smash Bros is good and Watch Dogs isn't, so there you go. Super Smash Bros. is the fourth installment of the series with the same name as the original just to piss off future historians. And do we even need to explain what Smash Bros. is at this point? You punch, you jump, you run, you grab, you fall because you accidentally did a side special instead of an up special because the 3DS Ocopad is a piece of shit on a sandwich. On the 3DS version, the game runs like butter. Smooth, consistent, and tasty on a piece of toast. And I found myself genuinely surprised how well the game held up, despite the 3DS's limited hardware. The amount of characters on the roster is outstanding, almost to an overwhelming degree. But there are a few characters that do seem a bit half-assed. Like the Wii Fit Trainer. Seriously, that just sounds like a fucking April Fool's joke. Who are they gonna add for the next Smash Bros? The silhouette guy who comes up whenever you put in a Wii game? Oh god, I shouldn't be giving them ideas. And lest we forget, there's the truckload of new content. There's the custom movesets, the playable Miis, the 8-player the clusterfucks, the little big planet style level creator, for fun and for glory modes, the multiple final destination stages, and other game modes like Smash Run and Smash Tour. There's no other way to say it. Super Smash Bros. is fucking amazing, and it far surpasses all other installments. Yet despite all this, there is still a single lingering question hovering over everyone's heads. Why haven't I done a video on Five Nights at Freddy's? Alright, fine, two questions. Why is this game at number two? With the amount of hype and advancements this game has, why isn't it at number one? What other game could have possibly taken first place? The answer is two words. 
Danganronpa 2 Goodbye Despair. I was agonizing over whether to give the Game of the Year award to this or Trigger Happy Havoc. After thinking about it long and hard, I ultimately decided to give it to the sequel, only because it does all the stuff in the first game, but far better. But wait a minute, what does this game do? Thanks for asking, voice in my head. No problem, don't forget to kill the whores. Dingle Rumpus is a murder mystery visual novel centered around 15 students trapped in a high school by two faces teddy bear, and the only way they can escape is to kill another student and get away with it. When a student does get inevitably murdered, it's up to you and your sexy sidekick to collect evidence and ultimately finger the perpetrator. And when you're not investigating crime scenes, you get to interact with many of the colorful characters. Give them presents, have a character building chat with them, and in exchange they'll give you a skill that'll help during gameplay. So basically it's the love child of Phoenix Wright and Saw, with Persona 4 as the creepy uncle. And going back to the characters for a second, all of them are lovable and memorable and each one is unique in their own way. There's the fat one, the really buff one, the one with the crazy hair, the one with the other crazy hair, the one everyone hates, the one with the mess of tits, etc. And you're guaranteed to grow attached to at least one of them so it becomes all the more heartbreaking when they get killed. Or become a murderer and then get killed. So how does the second game improve over the first? Well, for starters, it now has 16 students stuck on a tropical island. And each of these students are all unique in their own way. There's the fat one, the really buff one, the one with the crazy hair. Okay, so the concept hasn't changed too drastically, but it certainly brings some new cards to the table. There are two new gameplay modes for the class trials, Rebuttal Showdown and Logic Dive, as well as improved versions of Bullet Time Battle and Hangman's Gambit. And best of all, the puzzles in this game are way harder. In the first Dangling Grandpa, discovering who the culprit is is rather predictable. With the of one or two cases. Which for a murder mystery game is rather disappointing. So in the sequel it was made a lot less predictable but still made tiny subtle hints towards who the killer is that will most likely fly right over your head and knock your hat off on your first playthrough. And then there's also the story which has more twists than the rush hour at a pretzel shop and it answers all the lingering questions that weren't solved in the first game. Without wishing to spoil there was a massive catastrophe at the end of the first game but it was never explained how or why it happened. But at the end of the second game we then learn how the massive catastrophe happened because the evil man listens to the voice in his head a little too much. Simply put, Dang It Rompol 2 is an amazing game. With the comparison to the original, it's a fantastic sequel that improves on everything that made the first game brilliant. But without the comparison, it's an emotional roller coaster that'll keep you engaged from start to finish. It's a game that grabs you by the bollocks and it's not letting go. If you own a PlayStation Vita, I highly recommend both of these games. Trust me, you won't regret it. So there you go, those were my top 10 favourite games of 2014. Now I understand there were some pretty damn good games this year, some that obviously didn't make it onto this list, um, but in the description I've left a sort of a special mentions list of games that I wanted to put on this list but I just couldn't because either I didn't play it or it was on a console that I couldn't play it on. So yeah, go check that out in the description. There's some really good ones that I wanted to check it out, like Shadow of Mordor, which I kind of wanted to play for a bit. And as also, uh, be sure to leave your favourite games of the year in the comments below because I'd like to see your favourite opinions on games as well. So anyway, yeah, my name's Skittles and I'll see you next time. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Fuck off, birds!